I like how the beginning of the movie, it starts out, I mean, you know, creepy and eerie. They give you the feeling that already something's going to go down. I mean, a lot of times you watch horror movies, it kind of takes forever for them to pick up and get into, you know, some of the scariness. Help us unload. If we want anything to sleep on tonight, we got to get moving. Okay. <sighs> Neat. I gotta say, too, throughout the film, uh, you nailed the, uh, what's going on look. <laughs> I think it's... it's <laughs> Isn't that a look she often has, though, in real life? <laughs> in real life. <laughs> burn. That is such a burn. <laughs> I remember speaking of, uh... Scared look one, scared look two. It's kind of like, yeah. how are you uh, to not to not feel so redundant? And like, you know, you look exactly the same in every frame of the movie. Yeah, like, I was worried about that uh, for, like, the like the one, two scary parts that I'm in. I can't imagine <laughs> what you had to do the whole time. That's, but it looks, it looks really good. It all flows. Here's a funny bit about the pangs, actually. With the toy... When we were, when the Pangs first came over and we started talking about the toy and there would be a toy, there were a lot of toys actually at one point and just kind of activated by the poltergeist, trying to explain to them what Old MacDonald had a farm, the E-I-E-I-O song, the Pangs didn't have a, it took days to explain why a musical box toy would be eerie or wouldn't be eerie and we kept going back and forth and they wanted, they were using a different song, we were talking about a different song. Of all the things that we would go around and around on, um, the toy having a song because we were like, no, no, Old MacDonald had a farm. It's like this very specific, very American little song. It's really Midwestern. And there's just, oh, no, no, here's this other kind of song. And I was like, there's, you know, it just we went around and around and around on that one particular beat. And then there was no sound at all. And all this came much, much later to put any music over the toy at all whatsoever. So Is there music over it now? Yeah, I just heard it there. Yeah, little... And they do put E-I-E-I-O on the toy now. I like that, though. That's really creepy because it's like, you know, it's a song that people grow up with singing all happy. And, you know. well, it's the same as the uh, little children singing in horror movies. It's always scary. Just like little children's songs. <laughs> totally. It's scary. It's like, why, why is that playing yeah, right now? It's dark. Street. Yeah, well, one, two, phrase coming for you, all that. You know, bringing you out here wasn't a punishment, Jessica. It's an adjustment for everybody. And the only way we're going to make this work is if we give it a chance. So, guys, what was it like working with the Pang brothers? I had a really great working relationship with them. I mean, I was nervous just because, you know, I thought that we'd have conversations day to day that wouldn't coincide. Just because, you know, I would maybe talk to one of them about something and then the next day he wouldn't be there and I'd want to go back and call the guy. And it wasn't, it, I don't know, it never worked out like that. Personally, they're really different, but directorially, it was never, they never had clashing views and never was any conflict. Um, I don't know, it was awesome. Danny's like... They're definitely different, though. You know, Danny's really, really sensitive and soft-spoken. Did you, like, hurt his feelings at one point or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> Super sensitive. Um, no, but he did. He, like, you know, he dealt with, like, the more family dynamic scenes and um, was just, I don't know, quiet and sort of introverted a little bit. And um, Oxide was really kind of, I don't know, he was really outgoing and funny and um, it was just, I don't know, pers personally different. That's a good point, though, is... Those guys were so, even though their personalities are obviously different, they were always very much on the same page. If one showed up to pick up a scene that someone else, had, his brother had shot the day before, it's like they just picked up right where they were and they just moved on. It was never, you never felt like someone was going to come over and have an argument because exactly. it, was, it had changed. They did play a game on us one day that was kind of funny, though. It was, it was a scout with Danny, but Danny was late for some reason. So they they changed glasses. That was the best way to tell. Yeah, is they that, yeah. one wore wire went rims, one wore kind of black heavier glasses. So he wore oxide wore Danny's glasses, and we went through the scout with nobody actually realizing what was going on for like 15 minutes until <laughs> Danny showed up, and there was a big laugh. They thought it was very funny, and the rest of us scratched our heads. <laughs> mm. See, they loved that. They, they tried to do that with me. I never. I was always like, uh, you always got oxide. <laughs> What's yeah. up? Well, didn't uh, didn't oxide have like a blonde? streak in his yeah, hair his yeah. hair would say because they would get confused as well but they would always say oxide peroxide right, peroxide. has it in his uh, hair it's blonde uh -huh. it's easy to figure out every time yeah <laughs> so we have been graced with some fresh presence here uh jason schumann our producer say hello hello <laughs> schumann william sherrick hello i think it was really exciting too uh just working with another canadian 
on, on the movie, uh, and a famous one at that, William B. Davis, Smoking Man. That was just luck. Getting William B. Davis was that he was available. He lives up in Canada. He's so famous from the X-Files, and that role was just something that had to be very particular. You had to look at him and think one thing the whole way through because he was a red herring, which kind of means we're hoping to throw the audience off thinking that he's going to end up being a big part of the twist. And he was so perfect. I was so happy to get him. And he doesn't really smoke because I went out to have a cigarette with him once and he doesn't do it. When I was little, like, I couldn't watch The X-Files. It scared me. And <laughs> I stayed very clear of it. I mean, everyone was calling him the smoking man. I was like, God, he must smoke a lot. <laughs> I was like, jeez. It's just famous for one thing. It's good. Rob Tappert's wife, uh, Lucy, when she took uh, acting classes, actually one of her instructors was William B. Davis. And he's got that classic look that we all re equate to the, the Marlboro Man, you know, where he just, he can look and you don't trust him. <laughs> Although, he really should have been trusted as, you know, as another yeah. one of those misdirects. Perhaps he, uh, yeah, one of the messengers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> indeed. Dylan was a part of our lives on television for so many years with the practice and I was a huge fan of his and he feels Americana just like John Corbett you know in different but the exact opposite way I just bought him as the city person who wanted to get back to these roots because he does feel like he has this middle America quality to him that's so it, you want to embrace um, so when we knew he was interested it was it just felt like a good fit and as a family unit you know trying to picture what they would look like together we thought it was uh, we thought it would work really well and who did Jess look more like, mom or dad, was what I wasn't sure of? Mom, by far, mom. Right? I think the hair was like mom. No, I think the face. So like, yeah. I think the, I'm not sure dad was the real dad, is what I was always thinking. <laughs> Milk man. Milk man. <laughs> Milk man. <laughs> that, was, that was one of the storylines that they bounced around, too, was that it was like the stepmother wasn't the actual... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, thank you. That's, that that oh was. God. No problem. Just doing my job. It was actually <laughs> up to three weeks before the beginning of the movie, we had made Penelope the stepmom and then changed it back at the very last minute because we felt that, uh, uh, who cared? Yeah. Right. That's, <laughs> cared about that's, that thing. script changed so much, we could probably go shoot the original right. and have a completely different movie. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. Initially, it was going to be much more in the vein of The Shining, uh, about a guy who goes upriver and goes a little crazy. When the Pangs came in, they re-envisioned it as a more of a ghost story. The original script had nothing supernatural in it. They really brought a distinct mindset to the movie about how they feel about ghosts, about how they feel about horror. We thought this might be another level of interest for the horror genre is to take a real Americana story and give it that twist. Penny. William and I have been fans of Penelope since the 80s and Adventures in Babysitting and Kindergarten Cop and Other, other People's, people's money. money. and You can't forget Other People's Money. Jeez, on and on and on. All, of course, her great performance in with uh, Al Pacino and Carlito's Way. So when we heard that she was interested in coming up and doing it, got on the phone with her and listened to her take on the character. It was fantastic. And she actually, of all the actors, I think, uh, fit in nicely with the Pangs. You know, because the Pangs speak English here and there, and, but she seemed to take direction from them very, very well and understood her character from the get-go. Well, and I liked her in that one horror film. What was the one that was the, the relic? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Once we got there, it was kind of like, oh my god, Penny, you're in everything. I thought she was taking the car. A little moment of tension. Don't beat yourself up over it. Now here's one of my favorite lines. <laughs> this is awesome. Everybody laughs so hard. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sort of thing someone would do to you. Oh, god. Awesome. Oh, god. Dylan oh, McGermott, cringe. you a sexy. Things, huh? oh, yeah. yeah, everybody Here cracked up. The oh my God! Oh God! Why? Why? I don't Mark, know. Mark, are you responsible for that line? <laughs> Todd Farmer and I have been going back and forth all week, accusing each other of writing that, but it was it was one of the somebody know. else. It seemed like Dylan I wish I'd try that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'd still like to have it out. Oh my God! Well, no, no. I mean, it it makes the film, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> glad it is still in there. Farmer Sutra. People talk about that. Yeah, I've people. Heard, God. Yeah, everybody, right. everybody laughed uproariously when I saw that. Uproariously. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because horror films uh, are such a combination, you know, making any movies, this magic potion that doll gets thrown in and sometimes it comes out and it's great and often it's not. Yeah. And, um, but 
when you have, you know, when you've got all this weird tension happening, you need these funny little, sometimes it's not a, maybe a great line or anything, but it just makes